People always ask me, do you actually use maths in your job or was that Oxford maths degree just four years of unnecessary suffering while proving very obscure theorems? Well, today I'm here to prove to you guys that yes, indeed, I do use maths every single day as a quant developer. And no, it's not just adding some numbers in Excel because if it were, I'd be very upset. Actually, that would be rather tragic, I would say. From stochastic calculus to eigenvectors and optimization algorithms, let me take you through how math shapes my work in quant finance. And don't worry, I will keep it fun because I'm not here to reawaken your trauma from A-level further maths. Of course, maths is indeed quite a small part of the job itself. I do actually spend the majority of my time coding, but that's a whole of a different story. But yeah, outside of work, I've been spending more and more time learning how to grow online, how to actually share what I know in a way that connects with people and makes it very, very engaging and helpful for them. And honestly, I've learned so, so much from Skillshare, who are also very, very kindly sponsoring today's video. Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives with thousands of inspiring classes in everything from illustration and design to photography business and video editing. It's a platform built by creatives for creatives. So whether you're a total beginner or looking to just level up your skills like in something very very specific, there is something for you. What I love is that it is designed for learning by doing. Classes are broken down into short, very stackable lessons so you can learn at your own pace and most classes guide you through a hands-on project so you're not just watching, you are actually creating. Using the creative side of my brain is definitely something I miss doing uh, at my day-to-day -day job, so having a platform like Skillshare is an absolute game-changer for me. Lately, I've been using Skillshare to improve how I show up online. One class which has been super, super helpful for me is Social Media for Creatives. It works for practical ways to build your brand and grow online without using your personality in the process. I've also been learning how to create better content in Canva because it's very, very useful for thumbnails for Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Skillshare has a ton of classes on creative tools just like that and it's made the whole process feel way more intuitive and fun. So if you have been thinking about starting your own creative journey or just want to sharpen a skill you've been putting off for a long time, now is the perfect time. In my opinion, it's very, very important to train the creative side of your brain, especially if you have gone down a very analytical career path. And here's something very special for you guys. The first 500 people to use the link down in my description will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare. So get started today and let's get creative together. All right, so quick note before we dive in. Everything that I'm sharing in this video is purely general knowledge and not based on any specific strategies or tools used at my or any other trading company. I am definitely not by any means sharing proprietary models or trade secrets, just the kind of math concepts that are widely used across the industry and taught within academic settings. Think of it more like a peek in the types of math that you might inc encounter as a quant developer, not a behind the scenes playbook. So for those of you that don't know, a quant dev works at the intersection of maths, coding and finance. I basically build and maintain the tools that quants, aka the pure mathematicians of the financial world, use to model markets and develop trading strategies. Think of it this way, the quant researcher is the one who comes up with the theory and I'm the one making sure that the theory doesn't break when they hit run five times before the market opens. And to do that, I definitely rely on maths every single day. But obviously it's not the kind of maths um, that you might think of. It's not maths in the way you think. It is less about crunching formulas on a whiteboard and more about understanding the logic behind financial models, translating those into code and making sure that everything runs smoothly under real world uh, pressure. So let's break it all down. Let's start with the heart of modern finance, which is uncertainty. We don't know where the market's heading. If we did, I would be filming this somewhere outside on a yacht. Financial markets are noisy, chaotic systems. Prices move due to earnings report, inflation data, or because someone named Elon decided to tweet again. We cannot predict them exactly, but we can model the uncertainty. That's where the probability distributions come into play. In general, you will see concepts like the normal distribution, you know, the good old bell curve, in order to describe asset returns, but real markets are quite messy, so practitioners also explore other things like fat tails, skewness, and volatility clustering. Then there's also Brownian and geometric Brownian motion. These are, I would say, the building blocks of stochastic processes that model random paths, like stock price evolution, for example. 
So let's imagine tracking the motion of a tiny pollen particle floating on water. It will jiggle quite unpredictably, sometimes drifting left, sometimes drifting right, and sometimes not at all. Completely random, but still obeying some kind of statistical properties. This movement of the pollen particle through time is what we refer to as the Brownian motion. Of course, no model captures this perfectly, but Brownian motion does have its beautiful balance. It's random, yet quite statistically structured. Its key properties like stationary, independent increments and continuous paths make it a very elegant tool to simulate price paths and to estimate risk. So these are the main probability concepts, but there is quite a lot of statistics involved as well. Time series analysis is our bread and butter, I want to say. Think RIMA models, exponential smoothing and moving averages. For example, people do use regression constantly, testing correlations between factors, validating trading signals, you name it. Then there is also Bayesian inference, because where new information comes in, we don't just throw out the old model, we update our beliefs and adjust our probabilities accordingly. It's like if your flatmate keeps, you know, leaving the stove on, at first you assume it's random, but after the third time, you update your prior, they're a menace. Alright, this is where things get a bit spicier. Most financial data is stored in matrix form, as it returns volatilities correlations. For instance, quants would use matrix multiplication to calculate expected returns, covariance matrices to measure risk, and even some matrix decomposition techniques like the Cholesky decomposition, for example, for Monte Carlo simulations. Eigenvectors and eigenvalues, well, these do come up quite a lot, especially in PCA, for example, which is principal component analysis, which helps to reduce the dimensionality of uh, data sets and extract some key drivers of market movements. To explain it briefly, PCA finds new axes called principal components that capture the most variance in the data. And those axes are found by computing the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of the data set. For example, if you have 100 correlated stocks, PCA can help you find out the three or four dominant trends behind all that noise. It summarizes quite a big chaotic system into a few major drivers. From a quant's perspective, just think about it, this is huge. Imagine a trading strategy that needs to analyze, I don't know, like a thousand time series per second. That's quite a lot. But if PCA can reduce this to five or ten major components without losing much information, your code will not only get faster, but your methods will be more stable and less likely to overfit. Even portfolio optimization relies quite heavily on linear algebra. A classical example you might encounter in textbooks is the mean variance optimization, using matrix algebra essentially to find the best uh, mix of investments. All of this is only possible because the maths let us compress huge volumes of data into something more tractable and very powerful. You didn't think we would skip calculus, did you? Well, calculus, especially stochastic calculus, is the mathematical machinery behind derivative pricing. The most iconic example, well, you guessed it, the Black-Scholes model. You will see this in every university course on mathematical finance. It models stock prices over time using a stochastic differential equation. A quite essential concept is also um, Ito's lemma. It's a souped up version of the chain rule to derive the formula for option pricing. Then there are also the Greeks, you know, delta, gamma, vega, theta, partial derivatives essentially that tell us how sensitive an option is to different inputs. For example, someone might actually be spending entire days uh, just adjusting models to better estimate these because even small errors can translate into real-world losses. There are obviously a lot more nuances and these models are very very basic. This is what I would say is a starting point if you really want to get into quant finance, get a taste of it, and also understanding how they work, what assumptions they rely on and how they might break down under real-world assumptions. I would say that that's the key knowledge that comes up again and again in the field. Integration shows up too, especially in Monte Carlo simulations. The way quants use this is by running thousands of simulated price paths, then integrating over them to estimate expected payoffs. So yes, all those nasty integrals you hated in school, some people actually do them daily, but you know, with Python and um, fewer tears. Now let's talk optimization, where the maths hits the money and where it is meeting engineering. 
whether you're designing a trading algorithm or just trying to make your code run in under five seconds, let's say, you are solving optimization problems. This could be convex optimization problems, i.e. with a single global minimum or something more complex involving constraints and real-world limiting factors. For example, a quite basic technique that people have been building a lot upon lately is gradient descent or its stochastic counterpart. So what is that? At a very high level, gradient descent is a way of finding the minimum of a function which tells you, for example, how wrong your model's predictions are. Imagine you are standing in a very foggy hill trying to reach the lowest point in the valley. You cannot really see the whole landscape, but you can feel the slope beneath your feet. Gradient descent is like taking a step downhill in the direction of the steepest descent. Then you stop, you reach the slope and take another step and another and another. And eventually you have to land in a valley where the loss is as small as possible, ideally the global minimum. That's your one minute intro to optimization. <laughs> Even outside of math heavy problems, optimization comes into play in coding decisions. Which data structure to use, how to parallelize simulations, how to minimize memory usage. These are all practical questions, but they do require a maths informed mindset to solve very efficiently. Okay, here's something people very much underestimate. Quant dev work is not just writing equations into Python and hoping for the best. We spend a lot of time thinking about how to write code, how to structure it, how to organize it, and how to make it very efficient. You can think modular design, clean APIs between various components, reusable libraries, and very testable units. For example, when building a backtesting framework, you can't just hard code a strategy into a script. Designing a system which is modular, extensible, and efficient requires logic, abstraction, and very structured thinking. It's maths, somewhat, but it's software engineering too, and performance matters. Common practices might include, you know, vectorization using NumPy, parallel processing, and sometimes even rewriting critical parts of a system in C++ for speed improvements. I guess this does tie up quite nicely with my previous point on optimization in code form. It's basically like solving a massive system of equations puzzle, where the answer has to be readable, maintainable, and fast enough to execute before, you know, your morning coffee goes cold. But like that, a few very good things happen. Debugging automatically becomes way easier, collaboration becomes smoother and performance often improves by just thinking again and again how everything fits together very smoothly. Of course, this is not something that you would find in your typical maths textbook or syllabus, but it is one of the most rewarding ways I get to use logic in my job every single day, and I quite like it. So, do I use maths every day as a quant dev? Absolutely, but maybe not in the ways you would have expected. I am not solving equations on paper all day long. I'm thinking logically, structuring data, writing efficient code, and understanding the mathematical framework behind financial models. Math gives us the tools to deal with uncertainty, to optimize outcomes, and to solve complex problems in a very elegant way. And in a world where markets never stop moving, the toolkit is more valuable than ever. Thank you so, so much for watching up until this point, guys. If you have enjoyed this video, do hit that like button, subscribe, and drop a comment if you want to hear more about anything, any specific topics, really. If you want to see more of me, definitely do give me a follow on my Instagram account. I am a lot more active on there. And yeah, thanks again so, so much for watching. I wish you all the best in your future career, in your math journey, and I will definitely hope to see you in the next one. I'm sick of daydreaming I just want the feeling of you in my bed I'm down at this waistline, right below your waistline Want you by my head